on the audio, but I, I would rather that you use the, uh, the chat because I think it's easier. So I, you have a couple of minutes to do it. And when you have them, I want you to share one of them in the chat, okay? So we start now. So when you finish, okay, nice, the spirit. So I've got, <laughs> I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to make a little bit of a, <laughs> a, an agreement, a meetup agreement to try and avoid the, <laughs> the hot topic for today. <laughs> I think we should focus on other stuff. <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. Scrum Master Value to the Team. That's one I I love to talk about in the open spaces. People engagement. So. One minute left. User story value, that's a good one as well. Team commitment, that's a good one. Okay. Value of the daily standups, another good one, another good one. So next thing I want to do with you, I'm going to ask you to keep going on with this little exercise. And I want you to ask yourself, what do I really mean by people engagement, for example, until you find a specific behavior or thing that you can connect to the things that you thought unmeasurable. This may be hard at first, but don't sweat it, okay? If you can do it for each one of the, of the things you have identified. I want you, whenever you do it, I want you to write it down for, it, for yourself, okay? I'm going to give you a little example because I think this is, this is a hard part of the, of the exercise. And for example, what do I really mean by software quality? I mean defects and maintainability. Okay, but what do I really mean by defects? I mean density of defects in the code. Okay, what do I really mean by maintainability? The easiness of changing the code. What do I really mean by easiness of changing the code? Okay, so I want you to do that until you find something that it's easily identifiable, that you can watch it. It's observable outcomes, observable consequences, okay? Is it clear? And if you have a question, you can ask in chat, okay? But I want you to do that little exercise for a couple of minutes as well to, to see what is the re result of what you, what you wrote in chat, okay?
if you want it, you can you can share it in the chat with with us. You can you can put the the thing you wanted to measure and the thing that you actually meant by that. Like I really meant software maintainability, for example. If you want to, this is just optional. Nice, Bruno. Team is solving business or customer problems. Then I would ask you, <laughs> what does solving business and cost or customer problems means? But that's nice, nice reflection. So thirty seconds left, and we keep going. So time is up and I would like you to share it in the audio with me if you want. Is there anyone who wants to share his experience with the exercise? Okay, so let's go over the team's interests. Anyone else wants to share? I mean, the initiative to input the company's performance. I mean, the rate of initiative achieved in success metrics. Nice, nice. I like that one, Adelson. That's a very good one. You, you get, you get asking yourself, what do you really mean by? And this is the point of of trying to measure an, an intangible. Okay. Okay. Let's keep going. So we have a little bit of a disclaimer, okay? Because I didn't want to. <laughs> To disappoint anyone so first of all i just wanted to share with you that i'm not an expert on this topic and i'm just sharing what i've learned reading howard bw Hubbard's book how to measure anything and using it so this is my experience i'm not just some kind of metrics guru or something like that i just wanted to share this because i think with a little bit of exercise a little bit of theory and a little bit of just using it you get a lot of a lot of value out of it. So as you can see, as, as you have experienced, this is a participatory workshop and I would love for everyone to participate and learn. I am a big advocate for participation, for exercises, for you to be the center of this, of this workshop instead of me. And I usually say that I don't like to work. I like for you to do the work. So I just hope you doing that that you learn a lot more okay another thing i wanted to share with you is in my experience these are difficult concepts okay don't worry too much if you don't get it at first it's it's normal at least it took me a while to understand some of the concepts and the rest of them i'm still struggling to really understand but what i really want is to pick your interest to pick your curiosity. So you start to use these techniques as well. And I also wanted to tell you that this is a little bit of an experiment for me. I've done this workshop before, but I've, I've changed a lot of it. So I ask you to be patient with me, please. <laughs> and other things I, I left. And I want, I want to thank as well Agile Connect Lisbon and Diana and Nuno as well, who is not here, but he's the, the, he's the first person who asked me to, to do this. So 
I wanted to thank everyone that, that is hosting me today. Okay, so let's keep going. So a little bit of an introduction, just a little bit of inspiration of Lord Kelvin. And when you can measure what you're speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it, but you cannot express it in numbers. Your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of knowledge, but you have scarcely in your thoughts advanced to the state of science. This is an, an inspirational quote. And I wanted to talk a little bit about intangibles and I wanted to talk about what you what did you share? Okay. I don't know if everyone had almost the same experience, but I think you get the point. Okay. Yeah. When when we talk about intangibles, the thing that the problem it usually is that we have we have not defined we have not used defining techniques for the things that we want to measure. The thing is that we have to push on and we have to really ask ourselves or we have to ask the experts on the topic to, to really find out what they're talking about. You, you can see it here in the chat, for example, Adelson, he asked, what does the contribution of Agile Codes give to the company? What are the initiatives he conducts? What, what is the rate of initiatives that achieve its success metrics? So you keep going, you keep asking yourself that until you find something that you can actually see, that you can actually say, okay, that I see, that I can say, okay, this has happened two or three times. Okay, that you can measure, okay? Any questions about it? This is really important because it's like, half the <laughs> half the concepts right the intangibility of things there is no actual intangibility you just have to find what you're trying to measure okay okay next one one of the things that it really helps when you're trying to to define something that you want to measure that you are struggling with, with something is the glorification chain okay if it matters at all, it is detectable and or observable. If it is detectable, it can be detected as an amount or range of possible amounts. If it can be detected as a range of possible amounts, it can be measured. Okay, this is like a little mantra that you can you can repeat to yourself to to really get into that state of okay, but what does this really mean? Okay. Can I see it? If I can see it, then it means I can see a, pos a possible amount. So that means I can measure it, okay? But why do, we, why do we measure? I want you to think for a couple of minutes about the reasons you think you, we have for measuring. And I want you to share the most important, the most important reason that you can think of in the chat, okay? Yes, you have you have four minutes, well, maybe three minutes to think about it, okay? And when you have it, I want you to write it down in the chat, okay? Let's go. So this apparent the impact of a certain decision, okay. Okay. 
faster decisions, okay. Measure, we measure to know what something is or the current state of something or to compare two or more things, okay? To better understand progress, okay? To validate if one tested a hypothesis improved our work or not, okay? To be able to decide with more information, okay? Thirty more seconds. Okay, you want to you want to measure if changes have some kind of impact. Okay, to make it visible, that's a good one. To understand what impact was caused by a certain change. Validating hypothesis, creating assumptions, okay. Nice. I actually agree with most of them or all of them. And the thing is, I want to share what the author, what Ho Howard, what he thinks about measuring why does he measure okay estimate and validate assumptions estimations okay but why do you think well Howard Howard has has identified three reasons why we usually measure okay so the first one and the focus of this workshop and the focus of the book is to inform important decisions, okay? Whenever we want to make a decision, we need information so we can make better decisions. When someone said faster decisions, I think it's like, okay, is it faster or is it a better decision? You, you, whenever you have more information, you make more informed decisions. So it means that you make better decisions. So, Whenever we measure, we gather information so we can make those decisions and those decisions are better, okay? So there's more because the measurements itself has value in, in, in itself. There, for example, there's also a market study and it can be sold to other entities or to satisfy our curiosity. But the most important one here is this one to inform important decisions, okay? Whenever we measure, we want to inform a decision, okay? That's the that's the the focus of the book, okay? I'm, I'm not saying that whatever, whatever you said, it's false or it's, or it's a lie, but what I'm saying is the focus of this workshop is this, this, this approach, okay? So whenever we measure, we are thinking about making decisions, okay? Because quantitative models are better to make decisions than pure intuition, okay? It has been evidence and proof and there's a lot of, there's a lot of studies that show that Whenever you want to make a decision, it's better to make a quantitative model and use information to make that decision than just use your intuition. Even in situations where we're talking about experts with decades of experience, if you just use your intuition, it's not as good as trying to model the decision quantitatively and use that to make the decision, okay? So, Let's go back to intangibles, okay? Why is it so hard sometimes to, to get intangibles right? So why, why do we struggle with measuring intangibles? What are the 
typical problems we find when we try to measure intangibles. First of all, the concept of measurement. Okay, and, and I'm going to talk about how the author, how Howard, sees measurement and how most scientists see measurement. They see measurement as a quantitatively expressed reduction of uncertainty based on one or more observation. That is a mouthful, okay? <laughs> this is a, this is a, like I said, this is a complex thing, a complex topic. So what does he mean by that? And we'll, we'll go back to the other to topics, don't worry. And what does he mean by that, okay? This is the definition, okay? It's a big one. A quantitatively expressed reduction of uncertainty based on one or more observations. So what does this really mean? What does uncertainty mean? What does reduction of uncertainty mean? Okay, I mean, observations are, clear, are pretty clear, right? Whenever you observe something, you get some information and that gives you something. But how, how do you express that, okay? So I'm going to use an example and I'm going to talk about uh, team's velocity. I'm not going to talk about story points, it's just items, okay? Completed items. So this is a very typical uh, sprint velocity chart from a scrum team. I hope you all, everyone understands this. If someone is not understanding it, please share it in the chat so I can, I can explain it a little bit more. But let's just focus on the graphic, okay? We want to know how many points are going to be done in 20 sprints. Okay, because we want to forecast how much how much product or how much outcome are we going to have in twenty sprints. So first of all, I'm going to take out the estimates because that's some information I'm not going to use in this explanation. But I just wanted to you to see the typical chart. Okay, so now that we have that velocity, we can do this. Okay. Uh, we can pick the pessimistic velocity and chart it down, okay? So we can see that in the, in the 20th sprint, we will have 40 points, 40, 40 items, 40 completed items, okay? Completed items in, in 20 sprints, okay? And then if we pick the optimistic velocity, we can see that we, we would be able to complete 240 items because the, the max velocity we have reached is 12 items, okay? So do you think this is a good estimation between having 40 and 240 items? Do you think that's a good range of the possibilities of this team with the information we have right now? So I want if is there anyone who wants to to speak it or tell it in chat? Do you think this is a good range? Or do you think there's better there's a better range? I'm talking about this, this spread. That's a very wide range, isn't it? Okay, anyone else has the same opinion? How can we improve that range? Yes, Diogo, it's too wide, but at least it's based on data. I'm, I agree with that. Okay, you can see that this pessimistic line, it's a little bit too pessimistic, right? I mean, from experience and from what we can see, the team has been able to complete, 
complete at least five items in his in its worst sprint except this sprint so we have more information we have been measuring how many items we can complete so what if we instead of using that 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 sprint that pessimistic velocity we used another one we used the one from the second sprint okay we we can see that then our ranges become a little bit narrower we can see that it's from 100 to 240 that means that our uncertainty has been reduced that means that instead of uh, a 200 range we have uh, 140 range i think it is yes from 100 to to 240 that means we have more information okay uncertainty has been reduced with a little bit of information okay just because we can see that it would be very difficult for our team to go back to that to that velocity right our team has been fluctuating between 8 and 12 in in these last sprints so knowing that we can reduce we can we can shorten the gap right so if someone asks us how many points or <laughs> i'm still saying points how many items can we complete? I, I, I wouldn't say 40 items because that would be a little bit too pessimistic, right? We have more information, we've seen more sprints. So now we know that our worst speed would be like 100 items, right? So that means we know more about it. Is this concept clear? I mean, I know this is difficult but whenever I try to find the chat it's, it's giving me problems so this is a big topic okay uncertainty and uncertainty reduction because everything we do when we measure is to quantitatively express reduction of uncertainty based on one or more observations okay we don't need to find the actual thing okay when we measure we usually find that it's a range it's not just one thing it's not a hundred or an 140 it's between this and this so if we shorten that interval we know more about it and we don't need to find the exact number. Having that range lets us make decisions better. Okay? So the object of measurement, going back to intangibles, okay? I, I remember we were talking about the concept and now we're talking about the object of measurement, okay? What is, what is the object of measurement? What is the problem with the object of measurement? The problem is what you just felt at the first exercise. What we want to measure is not well-defined. Sloppy and ambiguous language gets in the way of measurement. We have to do an exercise of defining what we want to measure to find out if what we want, what, what, what do we want to measure? What is the actual thing we're trying to to find out okay and last but not least the method of measurement sometimes we don't know how to measure the thing but but most things have already been measured so it's not a thing it's not about us knowing how to measure but us knowing that we can find the way to measure okay I'm going to explain a little bit more later but now. So whenever we want to make a measurement, it is good to have these four useful, four useful measurement assumptions. So 
we can make um, better measurements or even not measure at all. So for usual measurement assumptions, the first one, and this is the most important one for me at least, is that whenever you want to make a measurement, you have to think about that it has been measured before. This is very important. This is the most important one of them because this one can save you days of work, like months of work. It can really take a problem that you think, okay, I don't, I don't know how to do this to, okay, this is done and this is really easy, okay? It can, it can mean instead of struggling to find out the solution to, I have the solution. So right now I want you to take the thing that you thought was unmeasurable and I want you to look out on, to look in the internet, Google, for example, and try to find a way of measuring what you put, what, what you wrote down in the chat, okay? And I want you to share it in the chat, okay? You've got five minutes for this exercise. If you have, if you have a question, let me know in the chat, okay? You may not find a, a solution, but I think some of you may find it. Some of you should find it at, at least.
We've got one minute left. Okay, has any of you found a way of measuring something they felt was unmeasurable? If you haven't, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you've, you found something interesting. When this year, well, last year, when there was this problem and I had a at my my job that we wanted to measure something and before starting I said okay but has this been has this been measured before and it turns out that it actually was um, there was another part of the company that it usually did like customer customer satisfaction surveys so that meant that we only had to take those those data instead of trying to get it ourselves. Okay, what is the second assumption? You have far more data than you think, okay? Just as I told you, usually you don't need to measure, you just have to find out where the data is. Sometimes that data is right in front of your eyes, but you're not looking for it, you're just thinking about the problem instead of thinking about the solution, thinking about, okay, so I want to see if the team is collaborating, but then you think, you think, okay, I've got this tool that it's they're using and this tool they're using, it's recording this data and I can see if that data is going to help me find out about that, okay? Just keep that in mind. You need far less data than you think. This is a very important assumption as well, okay? Whenever you are trying to solve a problem or whenever you want to, you are trying to define, to, to, to make a decision, uh, the most important information you can get is at the beginning. When you don't have any information, any kind of information is really good. It, it, it takes a lot of uncertainty away. So you don't need a lot of data to make the decision and you just need you just have to find a little bit and think about it and then think if you need more information or if you can make the decision with what you have okay and last but not least useful new observations are more accessible than you think sometimes we think that measuring is this impossible thing that we have to do but if you really think about it just with a little couple with a couple of observations and a couple of things of measurements, you can really just find out that information that you need to make the decision, okay? So here are the four, use, four useful measurement assumptions to, to do a summary. Remember, it's been measured before, just before doing any measurement, just look if it's been done before. You've got far more data than you think, instead of trying to measure things look for the data you already have. You need far less data than you think. Just think how much information you need to make the decision you want to take. And useful new observations are more accessible than you think. Just try and find that thing that it's going to get the information. Just don't make it too complicated, okay? So how do we apply all of this, okay? How does Howard tell us how to make those measurements, those decisions? How do we do this? Okay, so a, a lot of time ago, a long time ago, he created 
what he called applied information economics. So what he did was to create a framework to make decisions using measurements, using the information you get from the measurements, okay? I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in this framework because it's deep, uh, but but I want you to watch it. And it's in essence, it's really simple. This is just first, you have to define the decision you want to make. Then you have to know how much information you have now. You have to model the current state of uncertainty. We'll talk about the calibration training later. Don't worry about it. And you have to compute the value of additional information. Before we do any measurements, we have to think about how much value that information has for us, okay? And if there is significant value to more information, we do the measurement. Otherwise, we can just make the decision. We don't have to measure at all. If the information we are going to get is mm, costs more, than the value that we're getting from it, we don't do any measurements. Remember, we are measuring to make decisions, not just for the measurement itself, okay? So before we measure, before we do any measurement at all, you've seen that in the, in the framework, we've got three steps, okay? We've got to define the decision, model the current state of uncertainty, and compute the value of additional information. That translates to these questions, okay? What decision are we supposed to support? What, what is the definition of the thing being measured in terms of observable consequences? And how does that matter to the decision being asked? How much do you know about it now to model the state of uncertainty? And how does uncertainty about this variable create risk for the decision? So. Is there a threshold value above which one action is preferred and below which another is preferred? What is the value of additional information? How much money do we have to spend? And how much value are we getting from that information? Okay. So how do we apply these questions? Okay. So first, the final decision step. We've just talked about the the stuff that you wanted to measure, but the thing is, is first you think about the decision and then you see, okay, but do I do this or not? Okay, this is a ridiculously simple, <laughs> but completely legitimate decision model. If the cost of action X are, are higher than the benefits, we don't do this, but if the benefits of action X exceed cost of action X, execute action X. It's really simple, but sometimes it's just like that. Okay, do I want to do, I want to do this? Okay, but what is the cost and what is the benefit? And then we decompose those costs and we decompose those benefits to see what's going on down there. But if you want to make the decision, you can use this to make the decision, okay? So this is, these are the definitions of our certainty, risk, and their measurements. I'm not going to talk about them. It's kind of difficult, but the important thing here is that whenever we want to make a decision, we need the, that decision has to have uncertainty. If there is no uncertainty, there is no decision to be made because the option is obvious, okay? So whenever we want to measure uncertainty, we use the, the ranges things, the interval things, right? We want to know how much space does this occupy? For example, I'm going to use the example of the, the, the text, okay? There is a 60% chance this market will more than double in five years, a 30% chance it will grow at a slower rate, and a 10% chance the market will shrink in the same period. We are seeing those ranges whenever things change, okay? And the risk is, and in the case of this author, it's there's a chance for something bad to happen, 
that's it. That's a risk. We believe, we believe there's a 40% chance the proposed oil well will dry with a loss of 12 million in exploratory drilling costs. Risk is there's a chance and there's a loss. So that's the risk, okay? Okay, this is, a, this is an example of the book. And I know it's a lot to take in, but I think it's a very, very interesting because you can see how, how much detail the author gives you whenever he wants to to give you that decision, to give you that quantitative model. So this is a cyber a security system decision to be made. So what do we that, what do we want to know? We want to know if you, if we are going to spend a lot of money in security. But what what is going to be the the return. What is the benefit of this security system? Okay, so they're going to take into account the virus virus attacks. So what is the average annual cost of virus attacks? And he has this this formula, and he has for each of the variables, he has a range. So it's between two and four agency weight various attacks for a year and it's the same for each variable so if you do the calculations you know on average or on the pessimistic side and the optimistic side how much money virus attacks are going to cost to the company so now we know if spending more than a million or less than, than a million is going to give you any benefits okay So now we are going to talk about model the current state of uncertainty, okay? And we are going to talk about the calibration training. So how much do we know now about the topic? So what do we want? We want to express uncertainty, as I said, ranges, intervals, different possibilities, okay? So what do we, we what what do we use to do that? We use confidence intervals. I hope some of you <laughs> have a little bit of a statistics um, uh, background, but it's just a very simple concept. Okay, a confidence interval of a ninety percent chance means that that interval has the right answer with a ninety percent probability. So, for example. Let's, let's say that you want to know how many of your actual prospects, your client prospects, will become clients in the next quarter. You, you think and you think, okay, I know now that probably no less than three and probably no more than seven, okay? So three and seven. If you're sure with a 90% chance that the number is going to be between three and seven, you can, you can say that you have a confidence interval of 90% between three and seven, okay? Is there any question? Because I'm just going and going. I wanna know, I'm going to give you an exercise now. Don't worry, this is not, this is just me talking. It's not going to be just me talking, okay? So what happens whenever we estimate, whenever we do these, these calibrations? There's usually two types, two types of people. The ones who are overconfident, who whenever they say with a 90% chance in a confidence interval, far fewer from their, from their faults are in that interval, and underconfidence, people that, that say very big intervals that usually mean that it's way more than a 90%, okay? But how do you do that? So how, how do you estimate that uncertainty, okay? I usually, well, we usually ask people to say those ranges. The people with the information, the experts, are the ones who are going to give us that information, okay? You're, you're going to ask the, for example, the product owner. 
So how much money do you think this feature is going to give us? And you can tell him, okay, I don't want you to give me an exact amount. You can give me an interval. And I want you that interval to be a 90% confidence interval. So you're 90% sure that the money we're going to get from that feature is going to be between 100 and 1,000, for example, okay? And this skill, it's trainable. You can estimate uncertainty. It's a general skill that can be trained with a measurable improvement. And we are going to do just that now, okay? So I'm going to propose you an exercise. This is going to be a long one. And we are go I'm going to give you 20 questions, okay? Those are divided between the confidence interval questions and the binary questions, okay? Here are, here are the instructions, okay? For each of the 90% CI questions, you have to provide an upper bound and a lower bound. That range should be wide enough that you believe there is a 90% chance that the answer will be between your bounds, okay? And then there's the binary questions, which are true or false. And then you have to, it's a circle, but you're not going to circle my, <laughs> my screen. So you have to write that up, okay? And you have to say how, how certain you, you feel about your response. If you feel that your response is right and you're 100% sure, you have to pick 100%. If you, if you have no idea about the answer, you, have, you can pick the coin flip, the 50%, because if it's a binary question, it's a coin flip, okay? Okay, of course, you could just look up the answers to any of these questions, but we are using this as an exercise to, his, to see how well you estimate things you can just look up, okay? For example, next month sales of the actual productivity improvement from some new technology, okay? That's a very important thing, okay? Questions vary in difficulty. Some will, see, some will seem very easy and others will seem very difficult. It's not important that you get the answer right. The thing is focus on what you do know. What do you know about the question? And using that, you have to think about the bounds, okay? For example, you probably know Newton was alive in ancient Greece or in the 20th century. Okay, so is there any question about the exercise before I put the, the questions? Anyone? I'm going to give you a lot of time to do the test, so don't worry about it. If you have to think about, if you have to, if you have to make a question after I show you, it's okay. Okay, so here are the questions. You have the 10 confidence interval and the 10 statements. So I'm going to give you 15 minutes. If you need more time, I will give you more time. Don't worry. We are, we are doing great on time. So just go at it, OK? Whenever you finish it, uh, just uh, let me know in the chat, OK? Thank you.
have seven minutes left. That was the fast one, Carlos. So three minutes left. If if there is anyone who needs a lot more time, don't worry. This is just an exercise. This is not an exam. <laughs> I'm not trying to I'm not trying to grade you or anything like that. One minute left.
So here are the answers. You can check if you if you did well or if you missed a lot. I'll give you a couple of minutes to, to check it. So how did you do? Can you tell me in chat how many answers did you get right? How many answers did you get wrong? Stuff like that. <laughs> That's OK, no, no. You can be, you can get better at it. I, I I'm going to show you how. So before we continue. I want to do a little bit of an energy check. I want you to, to, to write down in chat, uh, how are you feeling right now with your energy? Can you, a one, a one means uh, you are very tired. Five means you're really energized right now. Can you, can you write down, can you type your L level of energy right now? Thank you, Adelson. Four. Anyone else? Okay then, so you've seen, I'm sorry if you're not able to check all of your answers, don't worry, I will share this, this presentation with you so you will see which, which answers you got, you got right. But this is the, the actual distribution scores that it usually happens, so how much, how much correct answers usually people get. So it's really between, it's usually a five or six. And if, you, if you're actually calibrated, if you know how to calibrate the answers, the uncertainty, this is usually the expected distribution of scores, assuming you're perfectly calibrated, okay? So how can you achieve better estimations? How can you become a better estimator? Okay, so I, there's there's five techniques. There's five techniques that you can use to improve your estimations, okay? So you can repeat and get feedback, okay? Take several tests in succession, okay? Assessing how well you did after each one and attempting to improve your performance in the next one. Just typical repetition, okay? Then there's more interesting techniques. So equ equivalent bets. For each estimate, use the equivalent bet to test if that range or probability really reflects your uncertainty. I will explain to you what that, what that means, okay? Consider pot potential problems, avoid anchoring, and reverse the anchoring effect, okay? So these are usually 
us as humans have these different biases that work against us. So we're going to see how we can use those biases to work for us, okay, in our favor. So first of all, if you want to see, if you want to, to check if you think that your range is correct, just think about an equivalent bet, okay? Think about a spinner wh when you win a thousand dollars with a 90% probability, or if you don't win anything with a 10% probability. Would you rather spin that, that dial or would you rather use your estimation? Would you rather use your your 90% confidence interval to win a thousand dollars? So if you think about if you think that you should use the dial, that means you're probably overconfident. That means that you're placing uh, you're you have used a very a uh, very narrow narrow interval instead of using the correct amount of interval and if you think that you should use your estimation that means that you're probably underconfident that means that you have you have used a very big interval so it means that that confidence interval is bigger than 90 percent so what is the correct answer the answer is that if you don't care about the bet or your range, that means that they're equal. That means that you think that your interval is exactly an 80% confidence interval, okay? So use equivalent bet or just ask people to identify potential problems for your estimates. Just assume your answer is wrong and then explain yourself why you're wrong, okay? Another way of doing it better is to think in, in, two, in two bounds. Separate each different bound. So there's a bound here, there's a bound here. So take this out and just think about a 90% bound, 95% bound, okay? And do the opposite. Okay. You can also use uh, your natural anchoring tendency to work the other way. Instead of starting with a narrow, a narrow interval and then making it bigger, make a huge interval and then try to make it make it shorter. Okay. This he the author he calls it the absurdity test. Okay. Instead of thinking, what values could this be? He says, what values do I know to be ridiculous? Okay. So there's this other test. I, I don't think we have time to do this. So I will share it with you. And if you want to test using those techniques, you can do it on your own, okay? These are the answers. And last but not least, we have the compute the value of additional information. What do we mean by that? Okay. Sometimes we want to quantify risk, but what the authors say is you should not quantify risk using the typical high, middle, low, or using intervals for the risk of, okay, from one to five. This does not give us any information about the risk, okay? And how can we actually do it? We can use Monte Carlo. Okay, Monte Carlo is a very powerful tool and it's, it's really easy if you, if you know what to do with it. Actually, in the book, he talks about it. It's, it's really complicated to, to explain in this setup, but I will try to make a little bit of an effort, okay? Just think about uh, maintenance, labor, and raw materials, okay? So we have the, those ranges. So the formula for annual savings would be MS plus LS plus RMS 
uh, multiplied by PL. That's your annual savings. And if you try to make those arrange, it usually will not give you a solution, but you can use Monte Carlo. What Monte Carlo means is just a brute force approach. You, you use random values for your intro box and the computation gives you a result. So let's say, for example, we can get a midpoint for 15 plus three plus six multiplied by 25,000, you get six, $600,000. So that would be the medium point, okay? So what is the value of information? And this is a very complicated thing, but I will try to explain it, okay? So the value of information is the expected opportunity loss. What does expected opportunity loss mean? It is the amount of money we're going to lose if we make the wrong decision. So if, for example, we're doing a marketing campaign and we have, we have estimated that the probability of success of this campaign is a 60%. And if it works, we will gain $40 million. But if the campaign fails, we will lose the cost of the campaign, which is $5 million. So what is the expected opportunity loss if we approve the campaign? So we say we approve the campaign, but it fails. So that means we are going to we are going to lose $5 million, but the value of the information is how much do we have if it's approved, okay? It's $2 million. It's the amount of money we're going to lose multiplied by the probability that we are wrong. So it's 5 million multiplied by 40%. That means that any information that helps us to make this decision to reduce that uncertainty, its value is two million dollars, or could be as as could be the maximum value of that information is two million dollars. Okay. This is a complex topic. Okay, and as I told you, I'm not an expert, and I I feel that I don't I don't have the right words to explain it, but. The thing is that you can compute the value of this information and it's, it gives you an estimation on how much money you should spend or you could spend on this, on this, on this information, okay? So this is more, more about it and this is the, the end. Just, just to review the five-step applied information economics process, okay? Remember, you have to define the decision. You have to know how much information you have now. You have to model the current state of uncertainty. You can use calibration training to do better estimates at the beginning. Then you have to compute the value of additional information. So you have to compute the value of the information you are going to measure and if the value, if the information it has enough value, you do the measurement. Otherwise, you just make the decision, okay? And that's it. That's how you use the applied information economics. So thank you for listening to me. And if you want, we can have a little bit, we have a little bit of time to, to do some questions. If you want to, I will see so. I'm going to activate all of your microphones. Mr. D, we sound do CO2. Hello? That's Kick away. I'm going to activate the microphones of everyone.
Tipo, não, não vai ser encerrado? Eu... Anything else? That's that's all for me. I hope you enjoyed the session. I hope you learned uh, a lot from it. And, uh, I know it's a complex topic. I know I stumble a lot when I'm trying to explain it. I this this is this is something that it's it takes a lot of time to get used to and to to think about it. Uh, I hope you get a little bit of what I, what the author tries to to translate for us. So it's not about it's not about just going to measure something. You have to think a little bit about it before you do it. And I think you have a lot of tools that can help you to to do that. Okay. So hope you had a nice time, and I hope to see you again. Thank you everyone for coming to the talk. Yeah. Thank you so much, thank Paul. You. Thank you. Have a nice evening and thank you so much for 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 this meetup. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye bye. Al. Bye. And please uh, fill the um, the form for the feedback that Adilson is posting on the chat. You can use that form and quickly uh, share your feedback with us. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Yeah. Yeah.